So we're going to go ahead and start the uh, Colossians 13, part 13 series. We'll be studying from chapter 3, verse 18 through verse 25. And we're going to start off by reading the scripture, the most important part. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Uh, verse 19, Husbands, love your wives, and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. And there is no respect of persons. Um, so this is uh, starting the series of verses here where he's talking about how to relate to others. Interpersonal personal relationships. Uh, Colossians 3:18 and 19, uh, the balance there between uh, wives, well, sometimes it's balanced, sometimes it's unbalanced, but the scripture says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. And notice that Paul puts a comment after the wives instruction and before the husband's instruction uh, he says as it is fit in the Lord so those two sets of instructions are separate they're not one blend one uh, it's nice when they work together but they're separate and independent of each other they're to be fulfilled regardless of whether the other person does their part or not. In the text, they're separated by the comment, as it is fit in the Lord. And those instructions are no more conditional than your salvation is. So, uh, the Bible does not instruct the wife that if her husband loves her, she should submit to him. And the Bible does not instruct the husband that if his wife submits to him, he is to love her. You see the problem there? Merely saying that out loud reveals the futility of applying Paul's teaching here in a conditional manner. It's not the wife's instruction to submit to her husband conditional upon whether he, lo the, her husband follows his instructions. And it's not the husband's instruction to love his wife conditional upon whether or not his wife follows her instructions. And that's the point of a Christian marriage, isn't it? It's an outworking of the grace of God shown us by God himself it's the daily practice of extending to others the grace of God that you've been receiving from God pass it on in other words and uh, it hurts sometimes uh, <laughs> to be gracious when you you feel like you should be mad or something something similar, <laughs> angry, bitter, uh, just like it hurt God the Father to send his son. Somebody had to pay for our sins, and by God's grace, Jesus Christ did it.
if you have been receiving, if, if you haven't been receiving, what if you haven't been receiving God's grace? Well, relax. Let God's grace be sufficient for you. Believe on Christ to have done everything necessary to give you everlasting life. Look again at Christ's instruction uh, that Paul conveys to be believed in, uh, let's see, it's in verse 18. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. And notice Paul did not say, if it is fit in the Lord making the wife the judge as to when to submit and when to withhold submission. No, Paul said that it is fit in the Lord for the wife to submit herself unto her own husband. Otherwise, Christ's instruction to submit is destroyed. There is an interesting comment at the end of Colossians 3.19. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Be not bitter against them. Why would a husband think he has the right to be bitter against his wife? The husband's Bible instruction call for him to love his wife, whether or not she submits to him as the Bible instructs her to. But after a while of her breaking her instructions, the husband might begin to harbor a little frustration and anger, bitterness. Uh, similarly, for the wife, her Bible instructions call for her to submit to her husband, whether or not he loves her as the Bible instructs him. But after a while of uh, his breaking the Bible instructions, the wife might begin to harbor a little frustration and anger. Ephesians 4.26 has a word of wisdom about that type of a situation. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Do not let that anger continue and build up into bitterness. So Paul says, be not bitter against them. If you let bi bitterness build up, worse things happen later on. Before the sun goes down, forgive each other. God inspired Paul to put a parallel explanation after each instruction. As it is fit in the Lord, and be not bitter, against them. Each of those statements cover the fact that uh, the instructions are given to failing humans. We all have flesh. The husband is not to be bitter against his wife in the event she fails to, at submitting to him, and the wife is not to be unfit in the Lord by withholding submission when her husband fails to convey God's love to her. They each are to be gracious to each other. We love having grace. We need to extend it. It's, it's the act of giving. They each are to be gracious to each other instead of legalistic toward each other. The best thing that Christian parents can do for their children is to model Bible divine instructions in front of them. That opens the door for the children to be open to the gospel when they hear it. Parents can't expect their children to be eager to join in in a way that caused disagreement and conflict, arguments and sorrow between their parents all their life. Protect your children from seeing or hearing the infirmities of the flesh that creep into your relationship. Quickly get back into following after the Holy Spirit's instructions instead of continuing to follow after fleshly failings. 
children learn to love they learn love for God love for their parents love for their neighbors by seeing their father unselfishly plan out and execute a loving unselfish life for his wife and for their children they learn love that way children learn respect for God and respect for the law and respect for parents, teachers, neighbors, authority, by seeing their mother faithfully and unselfishly submit to her husband regarding her life and that of their children. And then Paul continues with more brief summary instructions for children and parents, starting in verse 20, Colossians 3.20, Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Verse 21, Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Excuse me just a minute. Notice some things about what Paul said in Colossians 3, 20 and 21 that we just read. Uh, Christ had Paul write for ch children to obey their parents in all things. And he said, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Not if this is well-pleasing unto the Lord, but for this is, this is well-pleasing. It's well-pleasing. It's not... Uh, that the children are supposed to decide whether it would please God. You know, they're not in a position <laughs> to, uh, as far as wisdom and as far as uh, authority, to decide for the parents what the parents should say to them or uh, have them do. But then uh, Paul gives instructions about how to treat others with whom we relate. Paul writes verses 22 through 25 about how servants should treat their masters. Colossians 3.22 Servants, obey in all things your masters in the flesh, according to the flesh. Um, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. Paul's not condoning or denouncing servanthood or slavery. He's instructing how how to deal with the then current difficulties as a person saved by grace saved by grace and extending grace to others actually Paul's instructions to servants who serve in return for money it's applicable to employees today in, in the corporations or in uh, the stores, wherever employees work for money in our culture. The impact of what Paul teaches here is for servants to be a good earthly example that saved people are obedient to their heavenly Lord. Look at verse uh, Colossians 3.23. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Wow. <laughs> That's blatant. It's, it's uh, right at you there. Um, but we need to, well, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. From whom are you looking for your praise and your acceptance? From the Lord or from men? Any reward we receive from men will be short-lived and temporary. <coughs> and uh, look at the verse. If it, no, it's not there. Let me uh, remind you uh, that the verse 22 ends with a colon, not a period. Verse 23, as unto the Lord, not unto men, ends with a semicolon, not a period. 
So what it's saying here, and whatsoever you do, who's the you? It's not you and me. Is who he was talking to there, the servants. Well, if we're employed, <laughs> it would apply to us then when it, in, in that sense. Um, but it says, whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto uh, the Lord, not unto men. So we want to think about that verse in a different way than we may have considered it before. The verse just before, uh, before the 23rd, that would be the 22nd verse there, um, it, uh, I think we, we established it ends with other than a period, something other than, it's not the end of the thought in other words. It continues on into verses 23, 24, and 25. When you consider the context in the previous verse and in the context in the entire section from verse 22 to 25, Colossians 2.23 is still talking about servants and their masters. A favorite, uh, that 23rd verse is favorite to many people about doing whatever you do heartily. Do it heartily to the Lord and not to men. And we should. There, there are other verses that say that, but how, uh, in its context here, that verse turns out to originally be referring to servants obeying their masters and doing it heartily. And that changes the meaning of the last two verses in the chapter, too, relating them directly to verse 22. Servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Knowing that of the Lord ye, ye it says, since the context is still servants obeying their masters, then who is that ye in there, in knowing that, in the, that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance? Um, Paul is saying that you servants are responsible to obey your masters, to do what they require of you. In case there's any doubt about whether people are to please God or man, Paul makes it quite definite. You serve the Lord Christ. Let's remember that Paul is still talking about servants and their masters in verse 24. We can more easily see the connection between 22 servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh and verse 24 for you serve the Lord Christ we can more easily see that connection when we see how Paul teaches about servants and their masters in 1st Timothy uh, 6 verses 1 and 2 1st Timothy 6 verses 1 and 2 <coughs> Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, not that, uh, excuse me, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. Verse 2, and they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. In, in the 1 Timothy 6, 1 and 2 verses, we see that Paul relates the servant's obedience to his earthly master to the servant's obedience to his heavenly master. So in so it's talking about saved people still though. Uh, in Colossians three twenty four, know that of the Lord ye 
shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Paul is applying their physical and societal position as servants to their spiritual position, serving Christ. Colossians 3.25, But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. In, in that verse, Paul continues with the final verse in the context about servants and masters, but he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. The servants, uh, they're, they're <laughs> for servants, this is merely a restatement and reminder of the earthly principle in Galatians 6, 7, Be not deceived, God's not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. In other words, servants must not expect their masters to be pleased with them for their disobedience and failure to perform the required tasks. Paul says in Colossians 3.25, and there is no respect of persons. In other words, saved servants must not expect their saved master to give them preference because they are saved. There is no respect of persons. Okay, that brings us through the end of the chapter there, 3.25. Question time. Questions, comments? Uh, corrections, improvements, additions, bring it up. Keeping up with you, even though I hadn't been online, uh, Mike, on your Colossians series, you're doing pretty good. Pretty good. Just wanted to let you know. Well, thanks. Other comments? <laughs>